All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Lightner Observatory uh, and Planetarium Tuesday night public night live stream. So uh, unfortunately, the observatory and planetarium is not open to the public. Nothing on Yale campus is open to the public uh, until further notice. But I'm doing these live streams on Tuesday nights from the observatory uh, to stay connected with uh, fans of the Leitner Observatory and Planetarium who often come on Tuesday nights. Thanks for so much for all of your visits <laughs> over the years. And when the sky is clear, I'll set up telescopes for public viewing, live stream through uh, the camera and the telescope. Now, I'm looking at the uh, view outside, so you see the uh, live camera view uh, from the observing deck right now. And it's pretty cloudy out there, which was expected. Uh, although I, I've seen some beautiful clouds going by, it's fascinating uh, uh, meteorology going on out there, and the sun's going down. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on this, but I don't think it's going to be uh, clear tonight uh, for telescope, uh, telescope viewing, so some other night. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Fieson. I'm the director of the observatory. I'm in the faculty here in the astronomy department. Uh, I am happy to take any questions you might have about any of the astronomy stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, and you can post questions in the YouTube live chat over to the side. And uh, if I see them, I'll try to answer them uh, as they come in. What I'm going to do uh, is actually do a little bit of a presentation about what's up in the sky this week. So if we get a clear night this week, you can go out and look for some of the stars and constellations. Uh, the moon, of course, is up this week, looking very nice. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about astronomy news. And then we're very fortunate to have a guest speaker on the live stream tonight. We're going to switch over to a video chat with Dr. Angelo Ricarte, who's in Boston, I assume now, at the uh, Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And we're going to talk about black holes. Uh, again, some of you who are frequent visitors to the Leitner Observatory may have met him. He's been a, uh, he was a grad student here at Yale in astronomy, and uh, he made many contributions to public outreach here, doing planetarium shows and uh, many different public events, telescope pointings. And actually, uh, just before he left us, he did actually, uh, a public talk on black holes. So uh, I know for a fact that he's a fantastic science communicator. So we're going to uh, talk to him in a few minutes as well. And you can post questions for Dr. Ricarte in the chat, and we'll see those as well. All right. Well, let's take a look at my sky simulator here and see what's up in the sky tonight. Um, and actually, before I do that, I will say one thing about um, this comet that I've been hunting. So at the very beginning of doing these live streams back in April, I was talking about Comet Atlas, and Comet Atlas broke apart and faded. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, we heard the announcement of Comet Swan, and Comet Swan was visible in the morning sky. Uh, and there were some beautiful images posted from Southern Hemisphere amateur astronomers of Comet Swan. Um, and now Comet Swan is on the other side of the sun in the sky. And so we can see it in the evening sky in the Northern Hemisphere as it's swinging over the northern uh, top of the sun. Then it's going to go back through the plane of the Earth's orbit and down uh, back out to the outer solar system where it came from. It may break up. It may not make it that far. Uh, these comets that get close to the sun are quite fragile, so it, it might break. It might break apart. Uh, so I have been looking for Comet Swan on clear nights. I went out uh, two nights ago uh, to look for it at sunset. And I had said in an earlier live stream that uh, around this time of year, June 1st, 2nd, 3rd, uh, if you look right at sunset in the west, find the bright star Capella, Comet Swan should be near that. So I went out to look for it two nights ago and uh, see what the, uh, the conditions are right now. I definitely saw the star Capella. I, you know, I, could, I was using my binoculars right at sunset, still twilight sky. I found Pollux and Castor, the two bright stars in Gemini, um, moved down over and saw um, uh, found the bright star Capella. And actually, I can show you what it looks like if I go to interactive sky chart here. We can see what it looks like. There we go. Now this is, we're still an hour or so before sunset, so the sun's still above the horizon. And there's where it should be. Now the problem is that the comet is not very bright. So they're saying magnitude 7.7. .7. 
The faintest thing that you can see with the naked eye if the sky is really dark is about magnitude six. And in the twilight sky, you can barely see stars that are as bright as magnitude one. Uh, the smaller the number, the brighter the star. But if you have a pair of binoculars, that's going to concentrate the light and you can see fainter things. And I looked really hard. I could not see the comet. Um, I'm not sure this is going to be visible at all from where we are, because as it gets further away, it's going to fade and not be as bright. Um, but at sunset, you're competing against the brightness of the twilight sky and the faintness of the comet and the fact that the comet is still very close to the sun, so it's very low in the sky. Um, and I'm going to keep looking for it, but uh, uh, not terribly optimistic about seeing this comet. I'm still waiting for a good binocular comet in the northern hemisphere uh, over the next few years. We'll keep watching for it. Uh, something you can see in the simulation here is where the planet Venus is. Right, so uh, I talked about how Venus was going to go retrograde um, starting uh, May something, May 20 something, Venus started going retrograde, which means that it's going between us and the, in the sun. And that's actually going to happen tomorrow. The v Venus is going to be basically uh, in line with the sun. Um, and uh, I saw some actually interesting um, news about this on spaceweather.com today. Um, so Venus is very close to the sun. You can actually see it in the images from the SOHO spacecraft, this uh, telescope in space that's always looking at the sun, but with a, uh, a disk, a small mask to block out the light of the sun. Uh, the SOHO spacecraft mostly is studying the corona of the sun um, and the solar wind. Uh, there you can see what the sun would actually look like right there. Um, and then there's the disk that's blocking the sunlight. And then you can see some parts of the solar wind. Uh, sometimes you can actually make movies from these images. And sometimes you'll see uh, big uh, plumes of hot gas coming off the sun in a coronal mass ejection, usually started when there's a solar flare, uh, which may indicate an aurora is going to happen. And that's actually one of the things that they track here at spaceweather.com. One of the reasons I go here is to track uh, what's the solar activity and what's the probability of an aurora. Very low right now because, of course, the sun doesn't have sunspots, doesn't have many sunspots. It's in a quiet phase. Um, but we're still looking at the sun all of the time. And there you can see the planet Venus. And sometimes actually people will discover comets near the sun uh, that would not be visible from the Earth, from the ground, uh, just because the glare of the sun is so bright. So I saw this and I thought this was interesting. Its closest approach on June 3rd, Venus will be 29 arc minutes, half a degree, which is the angular diameter of the moon and the sun. Um, and uh, so that's where it's going to be. It's moving like that. So the Venus is going to be sort of right here tomorrow. The sun's going to move over here. Venus is going to move the other way. Um, and Venus won't line up with the sun. That would be a transit of Venus, which happens about twice every 120 years or so. But uh, I was noticing this announcement here that it's going to be closer to the sun when it's in what we call inferior conjunction, when it's in line with the sun going between the Earth and the sun, than it has been since the transit of Venus that happens uh, in 2004 and then uh, 2012. And that makes sense to me because um, it's now June, eight years since the transit of Venus that happened on June 4th, 20, uh, 2012. Uh, and this happens because of an interesting resonance between the orbit of Venus and the orbit of the Earth. So Venus is in line with the sun once every 584 days. Uh, and Earth orbits the sun once every 365 and a quarter days. And uh, five cycles of Venus relative to the sun, if you take five times 584, that's the same uh, amount of time as eight cycles of the Earth around the sun. So after eight years, Venus and the Earth come back to about the same place 
relative to the sun uh, in the solar system. Not quite exactly, otherwise we would see Venus line up with the sun and we could maybe even see the disk of Venus uh, in front of the sun, which is something that happens during the transit of Venus. So I thought this was nice. I remember well the transit of Venus on June 4th, uh, 2012. Um, I remember actually 2004, I went to uh, Indonesia <laughs> to have the chance to see it uh, because it wasn't vis very easily visible from the Western Hemisphere. So I traveled to uh, uh, Indonesia and I was on a beach in Bali with a telescope <laughs> watching the sunset so that I could see the transit of Venus in 2004. And then also in 2012, we had a beautiful view of it from here at the Leitner Observatory. It was cloudy and the sun was starting to set. And just as the, the, v, the transit was, was underway, the clouds parted and we could have a really nice view. And I could confirm that you could see it with your naked eye if you had eclipse glasses. You could actually see the little disk of Venus uh, in line with the sun. So it's been eight years since 2012 uh, and Venus is almost in line with the sun, but not exactly. And of course, we're going to have to wait about another 120 years in order for everything to line up perfectly so that we get a transit of Venus. But um, some uh, brave astronomers have been watching Venus as it gets closer to the sun. Uh, in some of my previous live streams, I was showing a, a view of Venus with small telescopes, showing it as mostly half illuminated and then crescent and bigger and then crescent and bigger. And then here you see it as not really just a crescent, but almost a full ring um, during the day. Someone's taking this image with a telescope during the day. And you can see what's going on is sunlight is being refracted by the atmosphere of Venus. Um, and that's letting us see uh, this part over here when normally only this side of Venus would be would be lit up. This is not something that I recommend anyone do because uh, Venus is very close to the sun at this time. And so the chance that you would get some stray sunlight in your telescope that would burn up your camera or burn up your eyeball is significant. So uh, <laughs> you have to take very careful precautions to prevent any sunlight from getting in the telescope if you're going to try to take pictures of Venus when it's almost in line uh, with the sun like this. Something that I did see uh, two nights ago when I was out looking for the comet, Comet Swan, was the International Space Station. Um, I was out at about nine o'clock and I saw a very bright satellite going through the northern sky and looked at it with my binoculars, couldn't really see any detail. If you have a big enough telescope, you can see detail when you track the space station. Um, and uh, re realized, oh, we're getting into a, a season where you can see the space station in the evenings uh, from New Haven. So uh, I was looking at some of the upcoming passes of the International Space Station. Uh, a really good website to do this is uh, Heavens Above, so heavens-above. Dot com. And if you go to this website, um, it'll actually you put in your the city where you are or your latitude and longitude and so forth. And it will actually show you what satellites are in your sky. Right. So we can actually go to live sky view here and it should show me what stars are up in the sky, but also if there are any uh, any any satellites up. Um, this is, uh, I think, a fairly frequent thing when you're doing uh, stargazing or looking through a telescope at twilight, you often see a satellite or an, an antenna or something like that. Um, and otherwise, you might just see the reflection of the satellite itself. Now, the space station is huge. The International Space Station is as big as a football field. Um, and so it can be very bright um, when it passes overhead. So uh, I look to see if there are any passes tonight. Of course, I'm also thinking about the space station because I'm sure like many of you, I watched the uh, the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon launch on Saturday was really uh, uh, delighted by that. It was really fantastic to see that everything went well and to see uh, state of the art, state of the art technology coming to <laughs> the space program is really cool to see their uh, 21st century uh, spacesuits and uh, <laughs> touch screens in the space capsule and so forth. Um, uh, and it was really fantastic to see the launch and the return of the booster and see everything go really well. So I was thinking about the space station uh, and thinking about going out to look at it with my own eyes after seeing it uh, two nights ago. So Saturday night, I guess it was. Uh, no, Sunday night. It was Sunday night. Um, if I want to see when the space station is going to go overhead, I can go over here to satellites. I'm blocking it uh, <laughs> at the moment. But uh, I have this option of 10-day predictions for satellites of special interest. 
and it will show me the time when the space station will be visible in the sky from my latitude and longitude. So uh, tonight, uh, there's going to be a really favorable pass of the space station almost overhead. So it says highest point at an altitude of 83 degrees. So straight overhead is 90 degrees. So this is a little bit off from straight overhead. And it's going to get quite bright, uh, negative 3.8 magnitude. That's, a, that's about as bright as the planet Venus when it's brightest. So um, unfortunately, it still looks like it's going to be cloudy. Uh, you know, who knows? Uh, the forecast is for a partly cloudy sky. So I, when it comes to uh, uh, 9.06 and 43 seconds, I'll run outside and see if I have the chance <laughs> to catch the space station. Um, uh, if not, you can actually see what the space station is looking at, and maybe we'll see the tops of the clouds uh, from uh, the space station that are over, over New Haven. So uh, NASA has a live view, a live stream from the space station. Now this is, the space station is in darkness. So if you look at this middle panel right here, this is showing where the space station is right now off the coast of Africa, uh, where it was an hour and a half ago. Um, so if you think you see it, you could run inside and look at this and see if it was there. Um, and then also where is it going to be in an hour and a half? And yes, here's that pass over Connecticut that's going to happen in a little bit less than an hour and a half. So uh, when the space station is not in the shadow of the Earth, uh, this, this is pre-recorded video. You can see the Soyuz uh, capsule over there. Uh, they show the live view from the space station camera. So uh, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see if there's anything to see from the space station when it's flying over Connecticut. About 9 o'clock. Okay, uh, now I am going to switch back to my simulator. Oh, actually, not quite, because there's one other thing I wanted to show here. Um, it's June, so that means there's a new uh, sky map from skymaps.com. So you can download these at the beginning of every month, and they will show you what stars are up in the sky from your location and the positions of the planets from your location, not the positions of the moon, of course, because the moon is going to move uh, along the ecliptic over the course of the month. So uh, you have to use an app or just know what the phase of the moon is in order to find where the moon is. Uh, but uh, this is uh, nice. We see that uh, Venus is gone, Mercury is gone. Uh, a lot of those spring constellations that I was talking about last month are gone. Um, and we're starting to see Jupiter and Saturn coming up in the east at sunset. So this is what the sky looks like uh, now around 11 or 11.30 p.m. And then by the end of June, 9.30 or 10 p.m. Um, another nice thing about the sky map when you get a new one is they have a calendar over here. So, you know, what are the interesting events? So uh, moon near the Pleiades on the 18th, uh, that's something to watch for. The Pleiades cluster is over here and it's uh, very close to the path that the sun and the moon take. So you will sometimes see the moon or the naked eye planets line up with the Pleiades star cluster. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting in here on the day of the summer solstice, which is uh, June 21st, we have an annular solar eclipse. So, uh, What's an annular eclipse? Well, this uh, is a situation where the moon is a little bit too far away, right? You've heard about supermoons when we have a full moon when the moon is close um, and a mini moon when we have a full moon when the moon's a little bit further away. The distance to the moon only changes by about 10%. So it's not a dramatic increase in size in either case. Uh, but if the moon's a little bit too far away, it looks a little bit smaller. And in that situation, it may not perfectly cover the disk of the sun during an, uh, what would be a total solar eclipse. And so we get an annular solar eclipse. So uh, it's a tremendous uh, sight. So the last time there was an annular, a good annular solar eclipse. I remember seeing one actually in May of 2012. Um, I remember going out to California to see that. Uh, but I, there was one more recently than that that was visible in North America, but I don't remember the exact date of that. Um, annular eclipses are maybe a little bit less exciting than total eclipses like the one that we had in 2017 and the one that we're going to have in 2024. Because the uh, disk of the moon doesn't completely cover the disk of the sun, you can't see the corona of the sun and it doesn't get as dark as it does during a total eclipse but you see a ring of light around the moon so hence annulus annular uh, for a ring 
Um, will any of this be visible from New Haven or from North America? No. So I went and looked at the NASA Eclipse website for this event. And here's the path that the, not the shadow, but the penumbra, the center of the penumbra of the moon will follow. And um, uh, you see it's going through Africa and then through northern India and through China. So these are the places you'd have to be in that narrow band there in order to see uh, an annular eclipse. Uh, you can further out, uh, it's not marked on this map, but further out sort of in this area, you'd be able to see some degree of partial eclipse, but none of that is in uh, Connecticut or New Haven. So we won't really get to see anything. <laughs> we won't really get to see anything interesting from here. Okay, let me jump over to my simulator finally and talk a bit about the stars and constellations you'd be able to see from uh, New Haven. So bringing up Stellarium, um, so I've shown this simulator many times. This is a free planetarium program that you can download from stellarium.org for Windows or Mac or Linux. And it allows you to simulate the sky from any location, any time, any date. So it's great for lunar learning the stars and constellations, for planning, observing sessions, um, exploring the night sky. This is a really fantastic tool. So uh, the sun is just setting right about now, right? We see the sun going down uh, over there in the west. And if we look over here to the east, we don't quite have a full moon. It looks like it's a gibbous moon, uh, maybe about 70-something uh, percent uh, illuminated. I've got it enlarged here so that it's easier to see the phase um, in the simulator. So that would look great through a telescope if it were clear tonight. Now, uh, if it were clear tomorrow night or the next night, we're going to be heading into full moon. And there you can see, go a little bit forward in time so you can see where the, the moon is. Now here we have full moon rising opposite the sunset, right? So when the moon is full, it's opposite the sun from our point of view here on the earth. The earth is between the, the sun and the moon when the moon is full. Uh, when the moon is full, it's a little bit hard to take uh, through a telescope because it's so incredibly bright. Um, you can see some interesting things on the full moon with a telescope. Uh, I like to just look at the moon myself <laughs> when it's full with the naked eye and uh, also sort of look around my surroundings, uh, what's going on. Try to get away from city lights, go for a walk in the woods if it's safe to do that where you are. Um, I like to look out around the park where the observatory is located and kind of see what's going on in nature when there's a full moon. Um, if you look at the moon, the full moon with a telescope, you can see some of the rays coming out of the craters, the ejecta from some of the brighter, bigger craters on the moon. But uh, just like doing photography at noon uh, during the day from the Earth, you don't get a very good contrast like you do when the moon is a quarter moon or crescent moon. We get those nice long shadows and the craters and the mountains and the rills really stand out. Let's see what uh, stars are and constellations are out uh, tonight on June uh, 2nd. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit and look at more or less the whole sky. I'll, I'll basically face south and I'm going to turn on the constellation lines and labels. So uh, I've talked several times about how you can use the Big Dipper to find other stars and constellations. So if I swing around to the north, here's the view of the Big Dipper. Seven bright stars you can see almost anywhere, even if you have light pollution where you are. These, bright, these stars in uh, Ursa Major that make up the Big Dipper are really bright and really obvious. And these two stars at the end of the cup point to Polaris, the North Star. So you can always find due north. You can orient yourself or orient means uh, orient literally means find east so you can boreal yourself <laughs> what i know what the exact uh, latin would be for find north um but uh you can find which way is north and of course uh, east west uh, and south so great for celestial navigation uh then you can also use the handle of the big dipper to find the bright star arcturus and we looked at arcturus through the telescope i think last week uh bright red giant star only 30 light years away also very easy to see even when you have a lot of light pollution uh where you are and it's the brightest star in the constellation of Bootes the herdsman if you continue along the arc you would spy the moon uh, well, the moon happens to be there tonight, but if you actually on a normal night keep going, uh, you spy the bright star Spica. 
which is the brightest star in Virgo. And it's very close to the plane of the ecliptic. So we always see the sun and the moon and the naked eye planets close to that line in the sky. And so these constellations that are near that line are the special zodiac constellations, right? Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpius, and so forth. So the moon tonight is in line with Virgo. And two nights from now, it'll be in line with Libra and so forth as it orbits around the Earth. Uh, let's see. I've talked about Ophiuchus and Hercules and Boötes. I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about some of the constellations that are up later in the evening. So these are more summer constellations. So I'm going to go to about 1130, kind of like what you see in the sky maps chart for the beginning of June. And I see the bright stars in the summer triangle coming up. And I see the plane of the Milky Way coming up. So this constellation right here, Cygnus, this is the swan. And some people call it the Northern Cross as opposed to the Southern Cross, which is a constellation you can see from the Southern Hemisphere. So it does, it does look like a cross. You can see the bright star at the back is Deneb. And here's kind of the vertical part of the cross, and here's kind of the horizontal part of the cross. If you keep going into some of the fainter stars, it does look more like the outstretched wings of a bird, uh, in this case a swan, flying across the Milky Way. There's Volpecula, the fox, not a very bright constellation. And then over here, Aquila the eagle, and the bright star there is Altair. Up, if you're facing east, up from... Uh, Altair and Aquila is the bright star Vega. Uh, one of the brightest stars in the sky, easy to find. It's almost directly overhead in the summer from our latitude um, and the brightest star in the what we call the summer triangle. So here's the summer triangle right here, Vega to Deneb to Altair. So uh, if you're out in the evening at like uh, 9 30, 10 o'clock or so, and you have a clear view of the Northeast any night this week, um, look over to the northeast, you'll see a bright blue star coming up, and that's the bright star Vega. Um, people have asked me a couple of different times uh, how to learn the constellations um, and what are some good resources uh, for doing that. Uh, Stellarium is a great resource, but uh, there's some other ones as well. You can get, um, of course, uh, f smartphone apps to help you, you can point your phone at the sky and it'll tell you what constellation uh, you're looking at. I almost consider that cheating now because I learned the constellations from star maps and books, but uh, <laughs> you know, leverage the technology we have here in the 21st century. Um, a couple of good apps that I've used are Starwalk, and actually there's now Starwalk 2, which I think is one of the best apps. And it's not very expensive, I think it's seven or eight dollars for your iPhone. And uh, it has a very simple to use interface. And it has this feature where you can point the camera of your phone at some part of the sky and you get kind of an augmented reality view of the sky that will show you what stars and planets and so forth are you looking at. Um, that you can get Stellarium for your phone. For, the, for your computer, the version is free. You just download it and use it. For your phone, you pay two or three dollars. I forget exactly how much. And it has the same... Um, point your phone at the sky and it'll tell you what you're looking at um, features. If you're old fashioned uh, and you want to be like me, uh, there are great paper resources that you can use. Um, something that's worth having is a planisphere. So that's what I have right here. This is um, a map of the sky that you can tune for the particular night and time. So just like the entire sky rotates around the star Polaris, the North Star, this char star chart, everything rotates around this rivet here in the middle, which is where you would find the star Polaris. Um, the way that you use this is to look around the edge and you can see the date, if that focuses, you can see the date and time around the edge. And so right now it's about eight o'clock. Um, really, I should set this for standard time. So it's, uh, what, seven o'clock uh, standard time. And so if I line up seven o'clock with the date, which is June 2nd, like so. If you use uh, daylight saving time, it won't, it won't change things very much. Everything will be shifted a little bit uh, over. So there we can see the stars and constellations that would be up in the sky uh, to the north and then over here to the east and then over here to the west. And then if you actually want to see the south on this particular planisphere, you turn it over and you can see what stars are in the southern sky. So it uh, doesn't require batteries. 
I guess it does require a flashlight if you're using it out uh, <laughs> at night, but you can buy one of these for about $10 and it's a uh, nice plastic um, and keep it for your uh, whole life and learn the constellations that way. Um, there are some great books that teach you star lore as well. And the one that I uh, learned the constellations from when I was a, uh, a kid is this one. This is uh, 365 Starry Nights uh, by Chet Ramo. And this was the book that I used when I was an amateur astronomer, uh, 10, 11, 12 years old. And the great thing about this is that every page is a day of the year. Actually, there are two, there are two dates on every page. So you see there's January 4th and January 5th and so forth. And for every page, there's uh, a little uh, paragraph about what, uh, some part of the sky that you can see and a little bit about the star lore, and in a couple of situations, a little bit about the astrophysics. So it's uh, 365 starry nights because as the Earth orbits around the sun, you'll see different constellations opposite the sun. So you see seasonal stars and seasonal constellations. So um, I don't know how much this book costs. I'm not even sure it's in print. No, I, it is in print uh, from Simon & Schuster. Uh, $18 uh, for this version, a list price, but uh, uh, definitely worth it for learning about star lore and learning constellations. I think this is a great book to get a kid who's 10, 11, or 12 and interested in astronomy um, and interested in learning the constellations. All right, any questions out there about what's up in the sky uh, this week or anything that I've talked about so far? I hope everyone can hear me. I hope I haven't been talking into uh, silence for, <laughs> for half an hour. Okay, well, let's switch over to our chat with uh, Dr. Angelo. So, Dr. Angelo, are you still there? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Well, let me make sure my that... TARDIS. <laughs> let me make sure that our audio is all, work... audio is all working and everything. I need to, there you are. Your audio is working, my audio is working. I think we're good. <laughs> How are you? Great. Good, good. Do you need to have a time machine to study black holes? It would definitely help, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much to, uh, thanks so much for joining us for the live stream. Uh, you did uh, two or three public talks about your research when you were a grad student here at Yale. Yeah. Um, you graduated last year, is that right? Yeah, uh, it's almost a year ago now. Almost a year ago. Longer. What have you been up to? Uh, well, I'm now a postdoc, uh, meaning I'm a full-time researcher here at the Center for Astrophysics uh, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, about a three-hour drive uh, north and east from New Haven, and uh, I spend my time working on uh, black hole simulations, and recently I joined the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, so um, I'm part of the effort to uh, image uh, black holes. That's amazing. Um, so I remember when this image came out from the Event Horizon Telescope last year, um, and it would be great if you could tell us a little bit about that image and that discovery and what we learned about it. Um, and then I have a couple of questions for you and maybe some people in the chat will have some questions for you. So if you could tell us a little bit about that discovery, that'd be amazing. Of course. Yeah, so uh, every galaxy, uh, like our own, the Milky Way, has a supermassive black hole at the center. Uh, that's a black hole that is millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. And, uh, We've thought that they're, they've been there for decades, but they've been very difficult to uh, directly image because they're so compact. Uh, the, the way you make a black hole is you take a bunch of matter and squish it into a very small amount of space. So if you had a black hole that was the mass of the Earth, for example, you need to squish it into uh, about the size of a peanut. And uh, the one that the Event Horizon Telescope actually imaged is uh, six and a half billion times the mass of the sun, one of the more massive ones that we know of. And that's enough mass to make an entire galaxy. Uh, but as, as you'll see, it's squished wow. down into uh, 
solar system sizes. So I have a few uh, animations and uh, pictures to show you. Uh, let me just share my screen for a sec. Uh, so this is a, a video made by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And uh, this is zooming in from the Earth all the way to this black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. So uh, Michael just uh, pointed out the Virgo constellation earlier. And uh, this galaxy is in the Virgo cluster. It's an, an overdensity of galaxies. Uh, this one happens to be at, at its center. And as we zoom in closer and closer to the center of this galaxy, uh, we're switching between views of different telescopes. Uh, mostly combinations of telescopes, actually, what we call interferometers. Uh, and that's the technique that was used to make this black hole image as well. So what we just passed through was uh, a bunch of the jet of uh, M87's black hole, what we call M87 star, since we call the one at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. Um, some people also call it uh, Poehi. And uh, here's, a, here's a still image of the object. What you're actually looking at is the silhouette of the black hole. A black hole is an object that's so compact that not even light can escape from it. Uh, and at the very center of this, you're looking at uh, the silhouette of that point of no return, what we call the event horizon. The only reason we could see anything at all is because there's a bunch of gas swirling around it, uh, which is radiating uh, actually what we're looking at here is uh, radio waves, uh, submillimeter waves. Um, and it's also producing that jet that you could see uh, even on much larger scales, uh, getting spewed out from, from this black hole at the center here. Uh, for a sense of scale, I like uh, this uh, comic from XKCD that came out uh, after this, this image did, which was announced April of, of last year. And uh, you could see that it's, uh, you know, maybe an order of magnitude larger than the solar system. Uh, but again, the mass of an entire galaxy. Uh, yeah, that's a great, uh, that, that's a fantastic. Uh, the thing to realize is that this is something a few times the size of the solar system, but it's 55 million light years away in another galaxy in another galaxy cluster, like insanely mm -hmm. far away. So we have to have a super sharp telescope <laughs> in order to see something right. that tiny. And, it's, and this is something else that amazes me, is that you see Voyager 1 is marked on there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which is the only uh, human-made spacecraft that's left the heliopause that we can think of as being out in interstellar space. And it's kind of what, about at the radius of that uh, event horizon shadow there? Right. Amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh so to get an image like this, uh, you have to cheat a little bit. Uh, no single telescope that you could make would be large enough to have the resolution to make an image. And so the Event Horizon Telescope uses a technique called uh, interferometry, in this case, very long baseline interferometry, combining the power of uh, telescope dishes around the world so that it's as if we have a telescope that's as large as the Earth. That's the only way that we could achieve uh, that kind of resolution. You can see there are, there are stations here from uh, the South Pole, that's SPT. ALMA is in Chile, that's one of the uh, most important and sensitive ones in the array. Uh, and then there are, there are others in Mexico, the United States and Europe. And uh, as the years go on, we're going to be adding more stations. Uh, the Greenland Telescope was uh, scheduled to join the Event Horizon Telescope this year, um, although the observations were canceled due to the uh, coronavirus outbreak. And uh, technology will be uh, increasing to get better images and uh, even movies, we hope, in the future. kind of thing that we, we have in mind when we look at this image uh, is, is this. This is a simulation uh, done by uh, Hotaka Shiokawa. And uh, like I said, there's a bunch of gas radiating around the black hole. Uh, 
and um, you could see uh, that it's actually uh, brighter on one side than the other. That's uh, due to an effect that we call relativistic Doppler boosting or Doppler beaming. Uh, it's moving so fast towards us that uh, the light on that side actually gets brighter and uh, the gas is moving away from us on the other side, so it gets fainter. Usually when we think of the Doppler effect, we, we just think of frequency. Um, that's why when a siren is heading towards you, it's more high pitched than when it's going away from you. Uh, but when you're moving near the speed of light, uh, the actual intensity changes as well. Yeah, so in that famous image that you showed just a second ago, the one that was released that is of, this is a simulation, but we have that mm -hmm. black hole image. Oh, there it is again. Yeah, it's brighter there on the bottom, which is showing us the rotation of the gas around the black hole. It's not that there's right. more gas or something like that. Yeah, so it's uh, moving towards us on the bottom, or more towards us than, than on the top. It's actually uh, nearly face on. It's inclined, oh. we think, at only uh, 17 degrees. Uh, but that's enough for, for this effect. I see. Yeah, so I, I spend my time uh, working on interpreting this data and uh, upcoming uh, releases from the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. I'm not allowed to tell you in detail uh, what we're doing, um, but uh, I can say that we're working hard on uh, analysis of uh, the time domain, uh, frequency domain, and uh, polarization of this object. Uh, and then there's another supermassive black hole, one that's actually larger on the sky than this one, uh, that uh, an image has not yet been released for, and that's the one at the center of our own galaxy, Sagittarius A star. Uh, we know this one exists because of the motions of stars. It's close enough, this being the center of our own galaxy, that astronomers like Andrea Ghez at UCLA can spend uh, their time uh, watching for years uh, as these stars orbit around. And you can tell by the way that they're orbiting that uh, something with immense gravity uh, that you can't even see in this image, this is actually, these points of light are actually real data from infrared cameras, uh, that something there marked, at, marked with a star at the center uh, has these stars in its grip and it has a mass of four million times the mass of the sun. So, um, yeah, we're that's, working that's hard huge, to, but uh, not quite a galaxy mast. That's like, right, uh, yeah. So, so it's interesting. That's like three orders of magnitude less massive than the M87 mm -hmm. black hole. And consequently, it looks three orders of magnitude smaller, right? right. The event horizon is much smaller, and that's why it's yeah. harder to see, even though it's much closer. Yeah, that ratio is almost exact in astronomical terms. Yeah. Are, are there other reasons why it's a little bit harder to see the black, the the event horizon of the, the Milky Way black hole? Are there any scattering problems or anything else? It's also yeah, so uh, it's, lower in the sky, I know, so it's a little bit harder to see from the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so scattering, as you mentioned, is an issue. Um, it's not, I think, the main issue, but to, to explain uh, what, what that is, uh, there's something between us and, and the black hole that's uh, making the images more blurry than we expect. Uh, it could be a bunch of free electrons in the spiral arm that's between us and, and the black hole, which is kind of annoying. If we could just move a little bit, if we could just wait a few million years for that to be out of the way, then things would be easier. Um, so that's, that's blurring the, uh, the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Uh, but the uh, bigger problem is the fact that because uh, this black hole is about a thousand times less massive than the one in M87, the stuff around it is actually moving about a thousand times faster uh, as well. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, one of the ways that, uh, so I mentioned that we use interferometry uh, to cheat as if we're uh, using a, a telescope that's the size of the Earth. Um, 
one of the main assumptions that goes into uh, interferometry, and here's that uh, picture again. Uh, one of the assumptions you usually make is that the image that you are looking at is static on the sky. Hmm. Uh, but if it's moving around a lot, it can uh, complicate the interpretation greatly and uh, make it very difficult to uh, create an image. Great. All right. Fantastic. Uh, let me see. There are a couple of questions here. Let me uh, jump back in here. So Planet Noble is asking, what are the next targets for the Event Horizon Telescope? So you just said you have the data for the um, Milky Way black hole. I think that's going to be really exciting to get that image um, mm -hmm. because that's our own black hole. That's our home black hole. You know, that's where we right. live. Uh, that's the one that's going to come suck up the solar system eventually. It's going <laughs> to suck everything into it someday. Um, are, are there, you said that you can't talk about what are some other projects. Can you say anything about upcoming interesting targets? Uh, is that, yeah, is that um, a data embargo or, they, or, or you don't want your competitors to know the, the rival well, Earth-sized telescope to, to, to scoop you on the... <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I, so I, I know that's not, gonna... that's not feasible. <laughs> Uh, so, we're, so we are going to keep monitoring uh, M87 and Sagittarius A star. Uh, the fact that the material is moving around means that uh, we would like to make movies, and there, there are interesting ways in which we can learn about the plasma and the black hole by how that material is moving. Uh, but also, there, there are some other sources, um, other AGN, active galactic nuclei, uh, galaxies with active black holes like these that uh, have, in fact, already been observed. Uh, just uh, about a month ago, um, there was the, the release of an image uh, from the Event Horizon Telescope of an AGN uh, jet. So usually, um, m most, most uh, other feasible targets, uh, you wouldn't be able to get the Event Horizon. You wouldn't be able to see that nice shadow, that donut that I showed you before. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could still see the jet um, mm -hmm. that, uh, if you remember from the first movie, uh, is the collimated structure on larger scales. And uh, those are interesting as well to learn about how black holes affect their galaxies. Uh, so yeah. uh, we think that even though these are solar system scale objects, they actually have profound effects on the galaxy as a whole. And if we can understand those jets better, that'll uh, allow us to better understand how galaxies form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking about some of the galaxies for which we have images of accretion disks, like um, uh, M51 and NGC. What is it, 4258? Is that the one? Do you know which one I'm talking about? Uh, the one with the masers, with sure. the super masers? <laughs> okay, I can't, I'm not sure I'm remembering <laughs> the right galaxy. Um, yeah, but I would think that some of those, since they're close enough that we can see accretion disks, even though mm -hmm. the event, the, the black holes are less massive and it's harder to get it to see the event horizon, maybe some of those. Yeah. Uh, so on longer time scales, there's a, there's a list of, uh, maybe a dozen or so. Um, even so there, there are, there are other ones with comparable event horizons, like in Andromeda or M31. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that one just happens not to be bright in the millimeter. Uh, which is where these uh, images are taken. So that's that's another consideration. Um, but there's a lot to do with uh, just these two sources for now. And uh, uh, but in the future, there, I think I think the future is bright. Uh, technology is going to keep improving. Uh, there's some talk about eventually having an additional station in space which will increase the angular resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope even more. Uh, you got to get off the Earth to make the telescope bigger than the Earth. So that would be... Yeah, there have been a couple of attempts to put <laughs> radio telescopes in space. Um, mm -hmm. I remember I used to work... I, I did research in interferometry years ago, and mm -hmm. there was um, a, uh, a satellite that was a European... Uh, inflatable radio telescope and it went out okay. on this big elliptical orbit 
Uh, but it wasn't very sensitive because it wasn't very big. So uh, mm-hmm. there was a very there were like ten objects you could look at in the universe that were bright enough, and they looked at all mm-hmm. of them and then they were done. So uh, <laughs> or people talk about well, let's put a radio telescope on the moon, which would be fantastic right. for many reasons. Uh, it's radio quiet out there, and it's, you could do low frequencies, and you could build a huge radio telescope. You know, lower gravity. There's so many uh, advantages. Mm-hmm. But the interferometry, if there were anything bright enough, uh, you know, it's almost like everything is too small to, to really be seen with a telescope as big as the moon's orbit. So uh, it's maybe mm-hmm. not as useful for interferometry as you might think, even though it was be, would be huge. Um, let's see. There's another well, question. Uh, oh, go ahead, uh, Angela. Actually, uh, there's a very sharp feature in these, uh, in these images that I don't, I don't think it really shows up very well in this one. Uh, but there's a feature that's very sharp called the photon ring, uh, ah. which corresponds to, uh, well, there, there's a point at which uh, light actually goes around in circles around a black hole. And if you were there and not shredded or burned to death, um, you would be able to see uh, your, the back of your own head if you, if you look forward. Um, <laughs> and that's a very sharp feature. And inside of that, there are even more sharp features uh, uh, going on in the sequence. And so we think that uh, an interferometer, even if you just had a, a, a two-element interferometer, meaning just two dishes, um, you'd, you'd be able to pick up a signature like that, which could tell you about uh, the black hole spin, for example. Wow, that's great. That's, that's very interesting. This animation that you showed, uh, that's showing the change in time. Do you know what the time scale is? Like how long is mm-hmm. that uh, change? What, how long is that movie in real time? Uh, don't don't know exactly, uh, but typically stuff moves around on time scales of uh, about eight hours. Whoops. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so this... for for Sagittarius star, the one at the center of the galaxy, it's just whipping around really quickly over the, wow. over just one night. Yeah, so the size of the solar system, but whipping around with you know, within in hours of so so the movies are going to be really spectacular then. Yeah, wow, that's tough then because the Earth is also rotating and the right. angle is changing <laughs> for the telescopes. That's a tough problem. We need a lot of smart people to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of smart people at Harvard and Yale <laughs> mm-hmm. and other places. <laughs> uh, let's see. There's another question here. Um, is there a linear representation regarding mass and apparent size of the black hole? Or if there is, does that mean that all black holes have the same density? Uh, what do you think? Um, so uh, the size does grow exactly linearly um, with, uh, with its mass. Um, the, the, size, uh, the physical size of the event horizon uh, has a radius that we call the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, it's just 2gm over c squared. g is the gravitational constant, m is the mass, c is the speed of light. And then uh, when you look at it on the sky, uh, you got to multiply by uh, square root of 27. Or it could be square root of 27 over 2 now. And now I forget. Um, but uh, because this, this black hole uh, lenses itself, uh, makes itself look bigger because of its own gravity. Right. Uh, now that doesn't mean that they have the same density because the the volume inside of of that region grows as that radius cubes. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So the 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 volume of the 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 event horizon space is determined by the mass, but uh, you know the actual. So that's like the the black hole, I guess. But the actual mass mm-hmm. of the thing, if you were to try and define the density, uh, you know, yeah, what's, so what's the thinking on that? Is thing. infinite uh, density, some finite density? Uh, well, according to our current understanding, infinite, but that can't be, right? right. So <laughs> we, we think, well, I'd rather say undefined. Undefined. Okay, good. Divide by zero <laughs> is not infinity. It's undefined. <laughs> These, uh, the, the, the mass yeah, in the yeah. black hole might have infinite or fi- uh, infinitely small zero mm-hmm. size, which is problematic. Um, let's see. Stars orbiting the black hole can reveal the mass of the black hole. What do measurements of the magnetic field re- reveal about the black hole? Oh, that's an interesting question. 
Wow. Okay. Um, this is, so I've been writing a paper exactly on this, mm. uh, for the past few months. Uh, and so I'm probably one of the best people in the world to ask about that. Uh, so there is a magnetic field that is, uh, threading the black hole as well as the gas around, uh, that's around it. We don't know how strong it is. Uh, and that's one of the things that we want to learn, uh, when we, uh, when we make these images. And one, one thing that is going to tell us about the strength and the uh, shape of that magnetic field uh, is polarization. Uh, mm. So uh, if you've ever put on polarized glasses and uh, uh, turned your head, I like to do that for fun sometimes. When I, <laughs> I always buy polarized lenses so that I can look through ponds and have a better view of fish because uh, reflected light uh, is polarized. Um, but there's light going this way and light going this way uh, as the waves are traveling. And uh, there are some signatures that were only discovered uh, within the last year that can tell you about uh, the strength and configuration of the, of the magnetic field, which has profound implications for uh, what's making this black hole grow, accrete, and shine. Mm -hmm. But the actual explanation is really technical. Um, if, uh, yeah, happy to talk more about it, though. Well, so the magnetic field in the accretion disk is very strong, right? I mean, it's much, much stronger than, say, the sun magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's driving the jet, that's put, that's accelerating the right. those relativistic plasma, uh, those particles out along these enormous jets that we see coming out of M87 and other AGN, active galactic uh, nuclei, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Although, <laughs> if I remember correctly, correctly, I mean, this isn't my area of special specialty like yours, but uh, the the black hole itself can't have a magnetic field, right? Because the magnetic field lines can't be created or destroyed, right? So they can't cross. Right. The yeah. So one of the main questions is: uh, Do these jets? Um, how do these jets get powered? Uh, do the magnetic fields? Uh, do the lines go into the black hole, or are are some of them just connected to? Uh, the disk itself, uh, there, there are competing theories about how to drive these powerful jets. Um, most people at this point um, think that the, the magnetic field is uh, connected to the, to the black hole directly. Um, but we don't even know to uh, within orders of magnitude exactly how strong the magnetic field is on a event horizon scale. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? I, I'll ask you the inevitable questions before we wrap up here. And if anyone else, if anyone sure. watching the stream has questions, uh, post them in the in the chat here. So, uh, what's on the other side of the black hole? If I travel through it, will I end up mm -hmm. in some mysterious dimension with aliens or with Matthew yeah, McConaughey uh, or something? As far as we know, uh, well, you when you pass through the event horizon. Uh, you may not notice anything, especially for this a supermassive black hole like this. Um, uh, but eventually, you will end up at the center at a point that we call the singularity, where as, as it came up uh, before, um, according to current theories, all of the mass is uh, squished to the center uh, in an infinitesimal point. Uh, but we don't have a, a theory of quantum gravity, so it's better to say we're not exactly sure what happens once you're at the center. Um, but there's no really other side of a black hole, as far as we know, like a wormhole, uh, as popular and fun as those are in science fiction. Uh, such solutions exist only mathematically in very idealized conditions and uh, universes that uh, have no beginning, that have always existed. <laughs> Okay, so 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 you can't answer the question whether or not love is the only thing that can transcend love and space, as was the tagline for <laughs> the movie Interstellar. Love, magnetic fields uh, cannot pass through the event horizon, but maybe love can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, that image of the, the black hole from the event horizon telescope and the, the simulation does look a lot like mm -hmm. the black hole in the movie. You know, the, the, the movie black hole yeah. looks... Looks pretty yeah, real, a lot of the, the same. Yeah, a lot of the same physical effects are represented, although it's uh, 
uh, a different uh, different wavelength entirely. Again, this is radio waves, and uh, in the movie that was uh, optical, what you could see with with your eyes. Uh, it, it's funny actually when I was uh, when that movie came out, I was at an Event Horizon Telescope conference, and uh, all of us were you know, pointing out the things wrong with it. <laughs> the 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 image in the movie. Uh, and so specifically, they didn't take into account uh, that Doppler beaming effect that you see here, uh, which uh, causes the side with the gas moving towards you to be brighter than the other side. That would just be unnecessarily confusing. And yeah. it was also cleaned up a little bit. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, if I remember correctly, that was a stellar mass black hole instead of a super massive black hole. Not that it's that important, but... Uh... But a different kind I, of black. Wasn't hole. it Gargantua? I thought it, I thought it was a supermassive one. Oh, I, maybe I'm forgetting the one that where they landed on the planet and it was too close and they aged and yeah, I don't I remember thought exactly. Was, I thought it was supermassive. Uh, I could be wrong. It's been a while be though. <laughs> uh, every so often we show science movies in the planetarium in the dome and we look at the science behind it, and we've shown movies like uh, uh, The Martian and Contact and uh, Armageddon, that terrible asteroid movie and uh, <laughs> a few like that. And I think we have shown Gravity and we've shown Interstellar, but we haven't looked. I haven't watched. I haven't seen Interstellar in several years. We should show it again and and talk mm -hmm. about it. And that, you know, especially now that we have this fantastic image and maybe by then we'll have some more images. Um, let me see. There's a question here. Is it fire or light around the black hole? Uh, how would you answer that, uh, Angelo? Uh, it is light, uh, and uh, these these are radio waves, uh, which uh, are actually just like light that you could see with your eyes, except the the wavelength of that light is much much longer than um, what your eyes are able to pick up. You can actually put out your finger and uh, uh, show the, the size of the waves that are that are uh, coming from the black hole that we see here. That's about 1.3 millimeters. I should put it on the on the real one again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, so light, not fire, but not the kind of light that you're used to seeing with your eyes. Yeah, the, this image and the other one has this reddish glow to it. It it does kind of look like flames licking or something like that. Yeah, it's, well, it, it's got to be false color. False because color. Yeah. That's uh, so, mu so much longer than, than your eyes could see. Yeah. It's the same. It's a similar kind of radiation as to what microwaves use to heat food, right? right. Millimeter, millimeter wave. Mm -hmm. So those invisible waves that are heating up your burrito in the microwave, black holes. The gas around black holes also emit that type of radiation, and so we can see that with radio telescopes. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Dr. Angelo, and uh, uh, telling us about what you're working on now and and explaining some of these images. Uh, really appreciate it a and answering questions. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, let's see what the sky is looking like out there. Still very cloudy. So uh, I won't run out and set up a telescope for, for public viewing. Uh, let me look at the uh, weather forecast. I wonder if we're going to have any um, uh, clear nights this week. Uh, it doesn't look that great this week. Maybe on Friday. Looks like next weekend, if you believe the long-term for forecast, is maybe going to be sunny and hot. Um, so hopefully we'll have the chance to go outside and look at the sky. Maybe Thursday night, maybe Friday night, maybe Saturday night. Um, we'll see. But uh, rain tomorrow, clouds tonight and rain tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, no stargazing, no observing <laughs> tonight or tomorrow. But thanks to all of you who have been uh, sticking around for this live stream. I'll post some of the information, the links and so forth uh, that we've talked about uh, in the description for the video if you want to watch it later and click on some of those links. Uh, if you want to keep, keep up with what's happening at the observatory uh, while we're doing live streams and online events and so forth, um, you can find our website is Leitner Observatory, so it's L-E-I-T-N-E-R observatory.yale.edu. And you can send the observatory an email using the email address info at leitnerobservatory.org. Or you're welcome to send me uh, an email if you have a question or a comment. Uh, I'm michael.fason, F-A-I-S-O-N, at yale.edu. 
And I will see you again next Tuesday. If it's clear, I'll have telescopes set up for live streaming through the telescopes. Uh, I might shift the session a little bit later in the day if, it's, if it is clear so that the sky is darker so that we can look at some more interesting things uh, during the hour so that I'm live streaming. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Clear skies and see you next time.